Peter Howe is still on vacation and I'm filling in for Peter this morning. With open hearts, open minds, we share a commitment to embrace an environment of inclusivity, not bound to or by a specific creed, written by one to be followed by all. As we often say, we don't have to think alike to love alike. As a congregation, we welcome you without prejudice, accepting diversities and differences of belief, helping us to grow both individually and collectively as an engaged community in our search for the truth. 
At the end of the day, it's our deeds that best define who we are, and with equal resound, our connection to the world around us. If you're new to Unitarian Universalism, we invite you to take a look at our mission statement, printed on the front of the order of service, and on the back are eight principles that we practice and promote within this setting and throughout the community at large. It's our tradition to welcome first and second time visitors, or those who have not been here for a while, to stand if you're comfortable in doing so, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Can we start on this side over here? Anybody? Okay, how about on this side? My name is Vaughn Chamberlain. These are my sons, Noah and Ethan. Uh, I'm a former graduate of Montreal, yeah. and so I'm back for the winter, and they came to visit. So. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. 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 Anybody else? I'm with Ethan, too. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming today. We know that there's many choices out there, and we're delighted that you decided to share your time with us this morning. If you have an interest in receiving our newsletter, learning more about who we are, or perhaps getting involved in our community, please fill out the white card located in the back of the pew or on the table in the foyer. They can be placed in the collection plate or again on the table in the foyer. We also have those involved in our membership committee identified with orange name tags. Those of you who are here, could you please stand for a moment? Thank you. <laughs> Please feel free to speak with these folks during our coffee hour directly afterward. We end this part of the service with respect that the land that we are on today was and remains the ancestral home of the Cherokee and of other indigenous people, who through stewardship, understanding, and conservation survived and still thrive in this land. We acknowledge their enduring connection to their homeland. Let's begin our service. Oh, one, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah, one, one quick comment by this. We're not supposed to do announcements, but this is one that I think um, I'll do my best Larry Perlman impression to interrupt. Um, today, right after the service at noon, our online auction goes live. So if you've not bought your tickets yet, please go to uusv.org, click on the auction link right there on the main page, buy a ticket, buy some raffle tickets. We have a week of an online auction. We've got 250 items valued at over $22,000. Um, and then next Saturday is the actual live auction event. We'll have a fun event with some food and some, we'll actually have a silent auction in the service here, in, in the sanctuary here. Um, it will be uh, a fun event and I encourage you all to help us raise some money for a local cause as well as for the church. Thanks. Let's, let's begin our service. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Roberta Madden, for those who may not have met me. Um, I'm delighted to give the opening words. Uh, but first we'll have the chalice lighting. Is Diane Graham here? No. I thought I saw Diane. No? May we have a volunteer to light the chalice? Thank you. She will light the chalice while I give the opening words, which are from William Shakespeare. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold, that is, the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. <clears throat> now please join in singing our opening hymn number 191. <clears throat>
715, your children. Okay. I'll begin. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come unto you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the clouds from which your children, as the living arrows, are set forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and bends you with might, that the arrows may go swift and far. Let every enemy in the archer's hand for this is the time in our service when we invite you to participate in joys and sorrows. Uh, you may drop a stone in the water for a joy or concern. Please come forth if you'd like to participate in that. This is the time in our service when we ask you to share your generosity. As you know, your contributions to our congregation are put to good use in our community, especially during this pandemic. In the words of Edward Hale, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Would the ushers please come forward? <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you for your generosity. Now let us join in singing hymn number 338, I Seek the Spirit of a Child. <clears throat> Today's reading is from the introduction to a book called Unbelievable, Faith, Reason, and the Search for Truth. It was a memoir by the late Dr. Joseph Hahn, and in the interest of full disclosure, it was one of the very first books that I published after I started Pisgah Press. In this introduction, Dr. Hahn defines some of the terms he uses as a way to clarify his own creative journey through life, which took him from fundamentalist Methodism in the Cumberland Mountains of Tennessee to being an ethical humanist atheist at the Asheville Ethical Society. And on that journey, he passed through Unitarian Universalism as well. This short segment from his introduction reflects the creative impulse that motivates all artists and writers and other creative people, and his understanding of how creative work helps us interpret the world we live in. The term he wanted to define in this particular section is one we don't often hear in this sanctuary, but we did earlier, soul. Soul is both the most intangible and the most essential aspect of conscious life. Dictionary definitions offer both specific meanings, such as the spirit of a dead person separate from the body and leading an existence of its own, or an individual person, a kind soul, and also abstractions, like the vital or essential part, quality, or principle, as in, for example, brevity is the soul of wit. At heart, though, soul is the sine qua non of human existence. It's the part of us that makes us wonder about life and death, and the world around us, and ourselves, and others. Or as Carl Sagan suggested in his book, The Demon-Haunted World, 
It also comprises the kinship we feel for other living things, that interdependent web of life. Soul is also the point of origin of the affection that animals feel for us. Our interdependence, say, with our pets or farm animals and other mammals is well documented. We and they mourn each other's passing. <clears throat> Dogs, in particular, seem to grieve at the death of a human companion they love. And even elephants have demonstrated some of the behaviors of grieving when they tend to their fallen kin and cover their bodies with leaves and branches. But for human beings, soul is the self-awareness that causes us from earliest childhood to consider, who am I? How did I get here? Why am I here? Similarly and equally, it's the sense of what is beyond ourselves. What is this universe I am part of? Where do I fit in? Am I but a grain of sand on the beach of some vaster enterprise? Now to Joe Hahn and me, it's not in answering these questions that we can define or identify the soul, but in asking. And as I mentioned at our men's group just the other night, my late grandfather used to say, any fool can look up the answers, but a wise person comes up with a new question. Back to this reading, without that tangible, intangible part of ourselves, the soul, we would not ask those questions. <coughs> And in fact, our soul also lets us feel kinship, not just for those who share our genes, our friendship, our family, our culture, but also to our greatest enemies. Many people think, legitimately enough, that pure intellectual curiosity is enough to motivate discovery and pursuit of knowledge that impulse that wants to answer those questions. But in fact, that's the work of machines and automatons and dictionaries and encyclopedias, and maybe even artificial intelligence, though I hope not. <coughs> we are homo sapiens, the rational, wise, intelligent people who ask questions simply because we do not and often cannot know the answers. Our forebear, Homo habilis, learned to fashion tools, not just out of idle curiosity, but with a purpose, because they enabled him and his genetic offspring to survive more easily. But habilis also shared that newfound knowledge of forming tools with others, ensuring that the larger community could thrive and survive. That impulse that is in all of us to be part of something larger than ourselves and to share our knowledge and our wisdom or insight, that is, as you will hear today, I think, the soul of creativity from artists and creators and writers, but it's also the soul of life. So now for a moment, let us ensoul ourselves in the eloquence of silence. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and now I'd like to
to ask Jeff Hutchins to come up to introduce our speaker. Good morning. Our guest speaker today is my friend David Madden, who turned 90 a month or so ago. David and Robbie, his wife of 120 years, moved to Black Mountain from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he was the Robert Penn Warren Professor Emeritus at Louisiana State University. David was called Jerry by his mother and siblings in Knoxville, Tennessee, where he was born and raised. He has written and published 65 books in every genre, including 15 works of fiction. His latest book is a memoir entitled Mama's Lost Piano, telling the story of a son's relationship with his mother over seven decades. In the 1970s, his novel, The Suicide's Wife, was made into a CB CBS movie of the week, starring Angie Dickinson, whose right leg alone is taller than David. <laughs> David is a giant in many ways, but not in all. I had the good fortune to get to know David when the short-lived Black Mountain Writers Guild was formed. I'm proud to call him my friend, and I'm pleased to welcome and introduce David Matt. Thank you, dear friend. Although I've never been a member, my philosophy is such that for seven decades, I've always felt welcome among Unitarians. I even sleep with one of them. <laughs> Drawing upon the power of my memory and imagination, late each night throughout the year 2017, just before going to bed, I shut myself up in my study and wrote a page or two of memories of my mother imagining from her point of view. Mama's Lost Piano was published in June, subtitled, Remembering and Imagining Mama's Life, an Impressionistic Memoir. <clears throat> my mythic memory of Mama is of my sitting in a chair by an open front door when a green Chevrolet hove into view across the street paused, then glided on, revealing my mother in loving sunlight, lovelier than I had ever seen her. The opening in the tall, thick, green hedge framed her, and she seemed to float toward me, wearing a dark blue hat and dress, high heels, carrying a shiny purse, not smiling until she saw me looking at her, her eyes and mouth and walk conveying a rare contentment given her life for the moment. <clears throat> After school, Opening the front door, Emily expected to see, this time, the piano Daddy had promised her. What she saw was a gigantic wooden crate setting smack in the middle of the Persian rug in the living room. Is that it? She shivered, ecstatic. Mother said, Yes, Emily, but your daddy said, wait till he gets home so he can bust it open in front of you. Wants to see the look on your face. Hell, I can do it myself. But just then, daddy swaggered in from work like a big shot, as usual, and seeing the crate, he roared, where's my crowbar? Holding it in her hand at the ready, Emily 
held the crowbar out to Daddy, who took and flourished it, taking a stance before the crate, who's almost as tall as he. Now shut your big blue eyes, Emily. The shrieking of each board and nail thrilled her to pieces. Daddy ripped out the last nail and pulled out the shrouded upright piano. It ought to be you that unveils it, honey. Stepping up to the piano, Emily jerked the thick gray blanket covering it with a flourish. The dazzling shine on the upright piano made her dizzy. I wish I could hug it. Why, don't she? Daddy spread his arms. She hugged it from one side and Daddy squared off on the other side. I want to hear you play Clair de Lune. <laughs> Enthroned, sitting before the piano as if it were a monument, she raised the lid, revealing ivory and ebony, keel, uh, uh, ebony keys, good as pearls. She dove straight into Clair de Lune, knowing she was playing it better than ever, while Daddy, his working day in his office, soothed, nodded as if to say, better than ever. Late that night, to be intimately close to the piano, she slept on the divan. No longer would she have to play the pianos at her rich girlfriend's houses. The next day after school, her friends sat all around the living room, some of the girls in the boys' laps, watching her play her gleaming new piano. Next evening, the sight of Daddy coming into the living room, off work, early, made her stop, her fingers poised over the keys. Mother came into the room. Why, Charlie, you look like death warmed over. You would too if... You kids, I can see we've got to have a family talk. Maybe <coughs> Emily can play for you tomorrow. After she kissed her friends goodbye, Emily stood slack-armed in front of her father, who sank deep into his chair and lit her lucky strike. What's the matter, Charlie? Mother stood stock still. Mr. Lombard fired me out of the blue. Fired you? Emily slumped over the piano keys. Yes, fired me. Mother looked up at the ceiling, shutting her eyes. Oh, Lord, Lord have mercy, what will we live on? Well, Chavan's Lumber Company said when I left Knoxville that I could come back any time. I better call him up. About to cry, Emily ran to her room, flung herself across the bed, and cried. The next afternoon, when she came home from school, the crate was the only thing setting in the living room. Daddy had sold all their furniture, except for what he could fit into the crate. Emily set her last evening, spent her last evening with the gang and finally let Freddie touch her virginity as a goodbye. <laughs> she had assumed that at least her piano would go back into the crate to go with him to Knoxville, which she hated. She was very young when she was there, teenage years in Cleveland. Daddy told her, Honey, I had to sell it. The, the crate, the piano. Man said I could keep the crate. On the train station platform sat the piano crate. Mama's lost piano becomes a haunting metaphor for the rest of her life, having lost her middle, uh, lost her middle class as a teenager in Cleveland also with the piano, and suffering seven decades of a life of poverty and misfortune in sooty old Knoxville, Tennessee. The only place Emily and her brand new husband could afford on their combined paychecks, low as they were, in South Knoxville, where Jimmy could be close to his big sister Kathleen who raised him and his big brother Elmo was a dark, dank 
basement, two-room apartment on Valley Avenue at the foot of the steep ridge where the Madden family failed to be farmers. Here I sit, South Knox, which the rest of Knoxville sticks its nose up at. Mother and Daddy five miles across the Tennessee River in North Knoxville. Just me and these four walls. Well, at least I'll see somebody. I'll see his folks up there up on the hill. Jimmy, when are you going to take me up to visit your folks? Oh, maybe sometime. Sometime when? I don't know. Ain't this nice down here where we're at? Close to Uncle David at the meat packing house? Then invite your Uncle David to come to see us. I can't. Why not? He's rich. Then Daddy went off again. Jimmy went off again up the hill to see his big sister Kathleen, it being daylight, because he was feared from going up there in the dark ever since he was 11, the year his mother and Daddy died. Breastfeeding Dickie, she wished she had refused to bring Dickie into this dark, moldy basement. Somebody knocked on the door. Two cops asked Mother to go with them to Siobhan's lumber yard. Emily was visiting the old home place, so she went with Mother in the police car while the lady next door babysat Jerry and Dickie. Jerry's me. The police led Emily and Mother into Daddy's <coughs> night watchman's office, so chock full of men, all she could see was Daddy's legs stretched out from his swivel chair. Is this man your husband, Mrs. Merrick? Well, when the men stood aside, Emily saw Daddy slumped sideways in his chair, his revolver on the floor between his feet, a hole in his head that had stopped bleeding. She screamed and could not stop. Mother told him, yes, that's my husband, Charles Franklin Merritt. One of the officers took a step toward Daddy. Looks like suicide if you ask me. Emily turned away, saw Daddy's leather holster hanging by a strap on a hook on the wall by the door. A snapshot flashed in her memory of Daddy sitting in that swivel chair holding up a macaroon cookie in one hand and a quart jar of milk in the other, his hat cocked back and that misty-eyed, faraway look in his eyes, sad-like, lovable, his flowery necktie loosened, his suit coat hanging on a hook behind him. Just happening to look through a window, Emily saw a brown and yellow police car pull up in front of the house. She opened the front door and saw an officer open the door of the police car and watched him swagger up the flagstone walkway to the porch and place one foot on the first step up. Are you Mrs. Uh, James H. Madden? What happened this time? We brought you your husband, but he needs his bathrobe before he can get out of the car. Carrying his gray model bathrobe, she stepped up to the back door of the police car and tossed it in at Jimmy. They, they brought me home, Emily. We found him under the Gay Street Viaduct, stripped the ball but his shorts, and them he did number one in. Scared probably when the other drunks stripped him. Thought you might want him home. Oh, yeah, yes, for all the neighbors to see. Yes, thank you, officer. Out, Jimmy, out! So he could get Jimmy from the curb into the living room without the neighbors seeing that he had only his bathrobe and a hangover on. In the chilly Sunday morning air, she half led, half dragged him along the walkway, up the steps, and pushed aside John, Dickie, and Jerry, 
who were crammed into the doorway, all of them so much trouble already, she feared they would trouble her the rest of her life. The three kids gaped at their daddy and followed him into the bedroom. Emily stayed in the living room, still feeling the chill, worried sick that Jimmy had taken to drink and the women at the factory worse than ever, especially laying out with that old whiskey-drinking Mary, that younger woman whose convict husband was in Brushy Mountain State Prison, liable to bust out any day and catch him in his bed. She imagined herself on the lookout for that scrawny Mary, finding her with Jimmy alone and smacking her into kingdom come for luring her no-good husband away from her. Emily always enjoyed riding the streetcars up front behind the various conductors, telling them her miseries, and they rattled off their own troubles. When David and Jerry sat beside her, he said she embarrassed him. Victor was tonight's conductor. She once, he once told her he liked her voice behind him all the way from the car barn next to the Bijou Theater to Atlanta Avenue in Lincoln Park. Always gay, that's Emily. I just know you're smiling behind my back, so to speak. This rain looks like it's not going to let up any time soon, Victor. She looked across the aisle through the window over an old man's shoulder to see how bad the rain was. Up ahead, she saw Jimmy and Mary huddled to avoid the rain in the archway of the St. Lutheran Church. Victor, would you mind stopping a minute and letting me out, honey? Well, what in the world, Emily? It'll only take me a second. She jumped up, whirled around, and set the overflowing grocery bag on the seat, lurched when the streetcar stopped, reached out and took hold of the car token receptacle, swung through the doors just as Victor opened them for, him, for her, and without looking down the iron steps, stepped smartly onto the street, making a car stop with a wet screech, stomped up the three gray stone steps into the archway of the, uh, archway of the sanctuary door, slapped Mary's face, pivoted back around and down the steps in front of another car and up into the streetcar, picked up her grocery bag, hugged it so tight that an orange rolled out and rolled toward Victor's seat at the controls. Have an orange, Victor. She giggled, but then wiped the rain off her face and sank into a smoldering fury. Uh, Emily, I always thought you had a wild streak in you. Don't tempt me. <laughs> David met her at the Jerry. <laughs> Jerry met her at the car stop, just as he had promised, and took the grocery bag from her arms. David always loves to hear me tell the story about that happened. When mother, could, when mother could visit and take care of the young ones, Emily walked up the street, her sheet music, of popular songs from the Cleveland years, along with such classics as Claire de Lune and the Merry Widow under her arm to a house on a hill, where a widow she had met in the A&P allowed her to play her idle, out-of-tune piano at least once a week. Age had palsied the lady's hands, and she looked to hear, but she liked to hear, live music as she struggled to bake fried pies for sale. Crossing the road, cars going like 60, scared the hell out of Emily, but she was free. She was happy, almost as if she were back in Cleveland. <laughs> Emily had finally gotten John and Jerry into that antique iron day bed that opened up in the kitchen by the stove, still warm, wondering where Dickie would be on the run, escape from Brushy Mountain Prison, sorely aware that this two-room apartment with shared bathroom 
was cramped worse than any of the many houses she had rented. In her bedroom, her refuge, after a long day, in Miller's ready-to-wear department, her feet killing her, as usual, she shucked off her chenille rub and, a robe and crawled into bed, settled snugly, and reached for the bestseller Forever Amber by Catherine Windsor. Her place marked by an ad for Stokely's Pinto Beans, two cans for 27 cents. And then she reached for the shiny box of Russell Stover assorted chocolates that she had craved all the way home on the streetcar. And the sight of the dark brown little paper cups, all empty, <laughs> made her instinctively fling the box across the room, setting the window shade to rattling. Lacking chocolate made her whimper. All the day's wrecked moments condensed into tears. When she dug an old iron uh, hot, uh, plas uh, hot plate out of the cram-full bedroom closet and then marched back down the ice-cold hallway into the kitchen and quiet as a robber gathered what she needed into mother's cast iron Hot, and briskly walked back into her bedroom. On the hot plate, she lovingly stirred the fudge to a boil until she knew, even without doing the hardball test, that it was ready. She beat it to a lustrous brown and then a dull brown to when the spoon began to resist, poured it out onto a buttered plate cut it into little squares, crawled back into bed, and propped up on the pillows, opened forever amber again, and slowly, slowly savored the fudge. She knew she so richly deserved. From the kitchen through the wall came John's whining voice, and then Jerry's voice, Mama, Mama, I smell fudge, Mama! Her mouth full of fudge, she yelled back at her, y'all hush in there, you're going to wake Mrs. Miller and her baby and her husband has to roll out of bed at the crack of dawn. She sucked the fudge that had drooled down back up into her mouth. When Emily opened the front door, a hateful, landlady announced that the house was ice cold because the damn furnace was on the fritz. When Ruby, Kay, and Ruth arrived on the streetcar, they complained that it was too cold to be waiting around for their boyfriends to show up to take them dancing. Without another word, Emily set the example, though, by kicking off the red high-heeled shoes she had worked in for eight painful hours and ready to wear, crawled under the quilts of her queen-side bed, still wearing her red coat and her blue flared hat. Wearing her new coat, swiftly dove Ruby into the bed beside Emily. Shoeless, wearing her imitation fur coat and gray pearl hat, Kay crawled over Emily and Ruby and inserted herself under the blankets next to the dahlia papered wall and made a performance of snuggling. Shy Ruth, the most beautiful and the only blonde of her many girlfriends and the most elegant, more slowly, fastidiously lifted what little quilt that was left and slowly swung in as Emily, Ruby, and Kay scooted inch by inch until Ruth was all in, except for one foot, her fake alligator skin shoe dangling from her toes. 
Their shoulders overlapped a little, but Emily felt snug, felt the altogether snug warmth of them all. Hey, you all, look, she said. Into her vanity mirror, Emily gazed upon the image of four 35-year-old women in coats and hats, fingered quilts up to their chins. Aren't we beautiful? When Ruby smiled, her perfect buck teeth lit up her exotic face. Her eyes, more dazzlingly, Emily kissed Ruby's cheek. That started all four of them kissing each other's cheeks, holding their faces in their ruby-nailed hands, rubbing shoulders, then hips, and then nylon stocking feet, the sibilance of them. She almost forgot. She dashed off a note. Dear Jerry, honey, the cops came and got John again. Now they'll send him to John Tarleton home for boys again. Bill Williams called and I begged him to come and take me honky-tonking and put Knoxville city limits behind me for at least a few hours. And do not forget to empty the drip pan under the icebox again. So go on to sleep, your mother. David knows I love to dance. And I stay out dancing all night sometimes. I just realized that he's never seen me dance. With Bill at her side and being among the girls again, she felt like a new person. Emily walked out off the dance floor and sat beside Ruby. <clears throat> Ruby said, <clears throat> Emily, I just want to know one thing. I see you working yourself every week long day to a frazzle. To a frazzle! And for the life of me, I cannot, I cannot understand how you could get out there on that dance floor every Friday the way you do. Tell me. Tell me. Why, Ruby, it feels like it's one way I can whirl myself back to Cleveland. <clears throat> Confined, except for that damned walker, to the special recliner chair Jerry had bought for, out of the advance for his new novel, Emily suddenly felt sweeping over her the ever-constant will to live. Not merely to live, but to enjoy as much of life every day that she could eat out. Dying was always possible, but damn it to hell, so was joy. The joy of the moment. And so in the moment of that realization, what she felt was not the constant pain or fear of death, but joy. <clears throat> she wanted to tell mother and daddy that, but too late now. But that was the kind of realization that Jerry, though, would understand. As the morphine was wearing off, shivering in the lucid certainty that she was dying, Emily sensed that Jerry and her loving grandson, Blake, stood by the bed. She knew in the solitude of her mind that they could not hear her voice saying, I'm dying, Jerry. And it hurts me to know that you will have to sell the piano you bought for me. And I know you will hate to have to sell it. Men with a truck will come into the house and wheel it tightly through the front door and up onto a truck bed. 
and you will take whatever they offered because with you the money never mattered. That it was the piano you bought for me would be the matter. Your mother, whose father bought her a piano at last and in no time quick sold it out from under her fingers when they had to move back to dirty old Knoxville and into this, this little house where the moving men with the truck would take a deep breath and letting it out lift the piano. Embraced by Jerry and Blake, she thought she heard Jerry say, Go into the light. Mama, go into the light. She stepped off as if into a dance to the swing and sway of the music of Glenn Miller. Just a copy of David's new book, the memoir about his mama. Please see him after the service. He has a few copies and he'll be happy to inscribe them. Now please join in singing and closing hymn number 314, We Are Children of the Earth. This is definitely a new one. I will play all of it. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. As I listened to David slash Jerry's moving account, I thought today is really uh, dedicated to memory and nostalgia, and I was looking out the window to our backyard here, and at the moment that I looked at a leaf, I saw it let go and flutter to the ground. And I realized also that Sue may have possibly inadvertently played a part of our nostalgia, nostalgia and memory today when she chose Imagine mm -hmm. as the opening song because it is the same week that, uh, of course, that is John Lennon's most famous song. And it was this week, just a few days ago, that John Lennon's last song, blessed us. I don't know if all of you are aware, but a new song called Now and Then that John Lennon wrote just before he died was recorded by all four Beatles. The first song in about 40 years that features all of their voices and all of their musical talents together. And it's a wonderful song. It has the phrase in it, Now and Then, I Miss You, which I think is just as metaphorical for today as that falling leaf. So as you go in peace, I hope that now and then the leaf of your memory will flutter gently to the ground. Thank you. Thank you.